Professor Entenman, let me begin by saying how honored I am that you've agreed to be part of this interview series. As you know, the series is uh, an interview series featuring scholars, prominent scholars who've contributed to the field of China Christianity studies. And um, one of the things I've heard people say about you in particular is that you were among the scholars who planted the first seeds in the United States of China Christianity studies. And interestingly, I just heard something about you that astonished me, and that is that maybe this could be, if this is true, I'd like to know that you first visited China in 1972, smack mm -hmm. in the middle of the Maoist era, and should I should say, the Cultural Revolution. Um, is that true? Yeah, it is. Uh, I went with the second delegation of the Committee of Concerned Asian Scholars, and um, there were 30 of us. We uh, it was uh, the kind of tour you had in those days. You didn't travel on your own, of course. Everything was arranged. They scheduled us morning, afternoon, evening, no free time. But we uh, saw quite a bit. We saw what, of course, they wanted to show us. <laughs> We also um, met with Joe and Lai and two members of the Gang of Four before they were known as the Gang of Four. And uh, some uh, prominent academics, Feng Yolan, uh, oh. Fei Xiaotong. Uh, these are people who are in books I read and you've met them. That's sort of astonishing. And let me just also finish by saying um, your published works have, uh, many of people who I've spoken with say they set the standard for our field. I'm thinking of your edited volume, uh, uh, Christianity in China from the 18th century to the present. You were a contributor to the first volume of, of the Handbook of Christianity in China, you contributed to China's Christianity. Uh, people say that you are the world expert on the Chinese priest Li An De, um, and, and you've worked a lot on Sichuan. But, <laughs> but the point here really is for you to do the speaking, so let's just go to the first question. That is, Professor Entenman, uh, what brought you to the field of China Christianity studies, and maybe what, maybe if you address that, add to that, what what brought you to the specific areas about which you researched? That's a really an interesting question. My um, entry into the field of China Christianity studies was uh, really roundabout, and uh, when I started my academic career, I guess when I was in graduate school, I really would not have thought. I would ever go in this direction. I really had no interest in Christianity in China. I knew very little about it. And I thought of it in terms of missionary history. And I, I, I thought that the field of uh, China's relations with the West was basically overdone, that uh, there was nothing new to be said. Uh, of course, I was in my 20s and I'm much wiser now. I know that there's a uh, a lot more to be said in that area. But uh, like a lot of graduate students in the late 70s, I was interested in uh, social history. I did my PhD work at Harvard where um, I was at, sort of at the end of the John Fairbank era. He retired when I was uh, writing my dissertation. And um, a number of the uh, graduate students were drawn towards social history. And I, I chose my uh, dissertation topic, migration to Sichuan in the early Qing period, uh, late 17th, 18th centuries. Uh, and one reason that appealed to me was it seemed to have nothing to do with China's relations to the West. I um, just wanted to find something in, that was really China-centered. Um, while I was working on that topic, I. I think it may have been John Fairbank who suggested to me that I look at letters of French missionaries in Sichuan to see what um, they had to say about social conditions, uh, migration and settlement. And um, I, my reading skills in French at that time were very minimal, uh, although I found after a little bit of study of French, I could read it as well as classical Chinese, which I'd studied for a long time. So. Um, reading these letters um, published in the Nouvelle Lettre uh, in the early uh, 19th century. Uh, I discovered these letters didn't have much to say about uh, social conditions, uh, migration, settlement, uh, my real focus. But I was really amazed to discover that there were, uh, by the end of the 18th century, 
some 40,000 Catholics in Sichuan. Uh, it seemed uh, almost impossible to me because of course Sichuan was not on the coast, it was far inland, it was hard for missionaries to get there. And this is of course the period when Christianity was uh, prohibited and persecuted. So um, I found myself sort of uh, backing into this topic. I, um, in my dissertation, I was looking at how um, migrants who came mostly from uh, Central and South China, um, how they established new communities in Sichuan. Uh, Sichuan had been largely depopulated uh, in the and uh, during the Mingqing transition in the uh, riverine of Zhongshan, Zhong, and uh, the devastation of the agricultural economy. So uh, that was what drew settlers to Sichuan. I uh, looked at uh, ways that settlers formed communities, uh, formed voluntary associations uh, to uh, give each other mutual aid and support, a uh, sense of community, and I was particularly interested in the white lotus tradition. But um, after looking at these uh, reports of French missionaries, I thought it would be interesting to look at the Chinese Catholics basically as another underground, illegal, heterodox, popular religion. And um, so I just uh, basically were, found myself sucked into this field. I was not prepared linguistically because uh, I had my linguistic training was in Chinese and Japanese, and um, there are few sources in relatively few sources in Chinese. Um, my um, major sources were in French and Latin, and I'd never studied Latin at that point. But I decided, in, when I was about thirty-five years old, it was time to start learning a new language. And so I sat in Latin classes at St. Olaf. Um, what uh, really uh, struck me was, uh, as I went into the field, was uh, the importance of Chinese uh, leadership in Sichuan during, um, in the Catholic Church in Sichuan during this period. Um, missionaries were often uh, very, well, they were, uh, they were visible, a visible minority and um, vulnerable in that way. Now, one thing I did discover though, is that um, many Chinese had never seen a European before. So when they saw them, they didn't think, didn't immediately think that they were Europeans. They instead uh, thought they were just sort of funny looking people with big noses and <laughs> a lot of facial hair. So um, it was possible for missionaries to go undetected. Uh, one uh, Martyria Bishop, um, uh, vicar apostolic in uh, the 1740s uh, claimed when he was arrested at one point that he was a uh, Yunnan Muslim and his accent actually gave him away. You know, it's interesting that you, you mentioned Chinese, this is a little bit of a tangent then, but you mentioned that there was Chinese leadership in Sichuan because the, yeah. the, the, in the Catholic community, because of course the narrative is that uh, uh, there was a, a very exclusive European uh, leadership over the church. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and that was, uh, the, basically that was the path I chose to follow. I uh, was interested mainly on the Chinese side of uh, the Chinese Catholic experience. Right. Um, not so much on the missionaries, although you can't uh, really separate the two in, in your research. Right. Well, then this leads us to the second question then, and that is, uh, you mentioned a, a linguistic journey, you know, learning classical Chinese and Japanese. This is sort of the standard thing that we learn if we study uh, Chinese history, especially imperial era Chinese history, and then an, an, an excursion into French and Latin. Um, but then in your archival research, perhaps, or in, and then some other area, was there ever a discovery that you particularly made that, that change the way you thought about your topic? Yeah, I'd say the uh, biggest discovery in that regard is uh, was um, when I discovered the existence of the diary of Andreas Lee. Um, I think I came across uh, it in a footnote in Kevin uh, Latourette's classic history of uh, Christian missions in China. 
And uh, I found it in the uh, Widener Library at Harvard and uh, checked it out. Uh, at that time, I didn't know any Latin whatsoever. But um, I, so I discovered the 677 page diary of a Chinese Catholic priest uh, covering some 15 years and uh, realized that if I were to be um, serious about studying this topic, I had to start studying Latin, which I did uh, about three or four years after I first found the diary. Uh, one of the exciting things was uh, going to the ar archives of the Michel Angergère in Paris and uh, um, seeing the original diary, examining it. I, uh, by that time, I had um, felt that I had gotten to know Andreas Lee personally, his personality quirks, his uh, character, his uh, uh, demeanor. So um, seeing the original diary was uh, really an amazing experience. Mm -hmm. um, I do recall, you know, something about handling the physical object uh, mm -hmm. that was held by the person about whom you're researching. It's quite an extraordinary, I held the last letter of Auguste Chapdelin and that was mm -hmm. quite, uh, you know, I'd read about him and all of, the, all of the turbulence that his life sort of engendered but holding the, the actual documents is quite extraordinary. Um, well, I, I then wonder, you know, you, that, this, is some, this is an experience that you had in Paris at what really is a great archive. Is there, are there any meaningful moments that you've experienced while researching in China that you think you'd like to recall? Yeah, um, a strange thing about my work on Sichuan, I began my dissertation, uh, researching my dissertation about 1976. And I didn't actually get to Sichuan until 1997. Mm -hmm. And uh, it was sort of strange in that uh, uh, through my research, I felt very much at home in 18th century Sichuan. And going to uh, late 20th century Sichuan was uh, quite a bit different. But uh, the airport for Chengdu is a Shuangliu airport. And one of my sources for my dissertation was the Shuangliu um, local gazetteer. And um, so it was uh, really exciting to go, um, go to um, Sichuan for the first time. Uh, I had made some connections with uh, historians at Sichuan University and I was invited to give uh, a couple of talks. And um, when I gave a talk on my research, uh, there were several people in the audience who were doing research on Christianity in China. Um, and uh, I was only very vaguely aware that there were any Chinese working on this topic at the time. Uh, I met Chin Hoping, who is uh, at uh, Southwest uh, Minzu University, was then the Southwest uh, Minzu Institute or whatever. But um, he's a um, Chinese, obviously Chinese scholar who um, I don't know if he knows any European languages, uh, but he knows the Chinese sources very well, and he's written some very interesting things. Um, so um, that, that was my first contact with uh, Chinese scholars in my field. Um, I was invited to a banquet where I met uh, three or four others who were working on uh, somewhat later periods, uh, the Protestant mission in uh, late 19th and early 20th century China, for uh, Sichuan, for example. Mm -hmm. One of the things you mentioned is, uh, well, going to the, the, the location about which you've researched. And we've all, those of us who've worked in China, we've all been to the, to the obligatory banquet where you're, with, right. where you're with the other scholars in your field. I wonder then if you can expand uh, and, and, and tell us if there's anything that, that the Chinese scholars, if there was a certain take that they had or anything that you found uh, mm -hmm. informative about your topic. Yeah, um, one of the things about Chin Ha Ping's work is that uh, in 1997, this was uh, China was Chinese academics were uh, only then freeing themselves from uh, kind of Marxist Leninist uh, constraints on their research. So um, there, um, a lot of the uh, research on uh, Chinese Christianity at that time was done by people who 
still put it in the uh, category of uh, cultural imperialism. Uh, Chin Helping was really looking at it as uh, social history. And, um, I, none of his work has been translated into English, unfortunately, but he's a leading scholar in this field. Mm -hmm. I always find it interesting that many of the Chinese scholars I've met, be, they, they sort of, they preface their research on Christianity in China classically with Wu Guo, you know, in our yeah. country. And then the, the narrative that is expected for the censors, and then it begins into what I would call just extraordinary scholarship, almost in the same vein that you would see anywhere else. Right. Yeah. Yeah. That's the first time I um, gave a talk on my research in China was uh, 1986 at the uh, Nanjing Protestant Seminary. And uh, there were a number of people from the uh, Nanjing University uh, History Department. And uh, uh, during the question and answer period, one, I think he was a graduate student, was really pressing me on uh, the question of whether the French missionaries in Sichuan were agents of imperialism. And um, I argued basically that um, before the Opium War, missionaries operated in China under Chinese terms. and uh, Imperialism was not always the best uh, analytical category to use in looking at uh, missionaries. Right. Uh, sorry, there's a fly buzzing around my head. Oh, <laughs> you need a fly whisk. <laughs> I, I do. Well, this is very interesting. I mean, one of the things that really strikes me is just how much Chinese scholars have influenced my own work. Um, and then you also mm -hmm. mentioned speaking at a, at a Protestant seminary in, in what we, this was the 1980s? Yes. Uh -huh. The 1980s, um, which is curious too, because this is an era with, with three selves. So, uh, but, 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 you know, many, many scholars, at least in my experience, often will speak at academic gatherings, but certainly not at seminaries. Yeah. This was uh, a little bit unusual. I had uh, met uh, Bishop Ding, Ph. Ding, Mm. Uh, and um, I think he, I think he was the one who arranged uh, my uh, talk there. Uh, there are a couple of people at Nanjing University who I knew in the street department. Mm. But um, yeah, th this this was definitely unusual. And uh, but um, it was the first time I had any contact really with Chinese scholars in this field. Mm -hmm. Um, Professor Entenman, I wonder, uh, we, we, we've been asking everyone the same, basically the same questions. And the one question that, and obviously you want to know most about you, but we've asked everyone if they could recall a pleasant memory or a significant memory they've had about another scholar or yeah. other scholars, plural. Um, something about someone else or some others in our field, um, some memory about which you think should be preserved in our field. Yes, uh, well, my real mentor in this field in uh, a lot of ways uh, is, uh, was Dan Bayes. And of course, he organized the History of Christianity in China Project in the uh, mid 80s. And um, this is when I was uh, really beginning my career. Uh, the uh, History of Christianity in China Project was funded by the Luce Foundation and, and it offered postdocs to early career academics. And uh, we had uh, two summer workshops. Uh, actually, I, um, I was involved in both workshops. I, I had two grants from this uh, uh, project uh, because I was only able to take one semester at a time. So I had a full year support, but they were uh, in, divided into two years and two grants. So I was involved in both of these summer workshops. And um, there, there was a lot of energy and uh, enthusiasm at these workshops. A lot of uh, young scholars, I was actually young at that point, um, and um, there were some older people in the field, uh, some really established people, like well, Paul Cohen was there, for example, um, Eric Zerker, um, David Mungello, people like that. So it was uh, really great to meet uh, these people firsthand and uh, exchange ideas with them. So um, uh, I'm not sure if this counts as a moment, um, but um, 
yeah, the uh, the way that Dan uh, brought people together and encouraged uh, young scholars. And, um, it was a good editor as well. So that um, I have uh, two chapters in that volume that he edited, Christianity in China from the 18th century to the present. Uh, I'm the only one in the uh, volume that was 18th century. You know, I, I should say, um, and I've, I've avoided talking about other interviews within uh, within an, a certain interview, but but Professor Bayes has been mentioned so consistently, and it's certainly this 1980s group that that he really inaugurated. Um, it's been something of a of a of a, of a, a universal. Uh, universally acknowledged significant moment. But you know, no one's mentioned about what it was like to work with, with Dan. I wonder if you could mention something about what, how, how his collaborative style was. What, how did he, what was he like to work with? Well, um, he was a very supportive uh, editor. He, um, uh, not only editor, but uh, what should I say? Uh, uh, a critic, uh, um, a very gentle critic who um, ma uh, made it possible to uh, really develop our work. Um, Dan was uh, really a very gentle person and um, you know, so congenial that it was very easy to work with him. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I just met him once, sadly, and wished that I had met him many more times. Well, we're, we're asking, we have a couple more questions here. Uh, uh, well, at least one more question. We're asking everyone what, what might seem like a bit of a hackneyed question, the question that you always ask uh, any senior scholar, but, but it's a question that many emerging scholars in the field of China Christianity studies, both in China, here, and in Europe, are really eager to hear about from especially scholars who are, who, who are more established, and that is, what hopes do you have for the future of this field? Well, one uh, big hope I have is uh, greater collaboration and uh, uh, mutual, what's the word I want? Uh, um, oh, great. Uh, my wife's here and uh, she suggested facilitation, um, but- um, That's a great word. It, it is. Um, uh, basically more interaction and uh, mutual influence uh, among Chinese scholars and Western scholars. Um, I think um, Chinese scholars are very aware of research done in the West and the opposite is not so much true. Um, I. Um, in 1998, I was at a conference in Scotland where um, I was uh, on the, I'm sorry, it was in 1997, was um, on the, uh, honored uh, James Legg on the 100th anniversary of his death. Uh, but at a conference, the theme was uh, China and the West. This uh, theme that uh, I sort of avoided when I was in graduate school. But um, one of the people I met there was uh, Gu Weimin, who was at that time at East China Normal University. And um, we, um, we became interested in each other's work. And uh, Professor Gu translated a number of my um, articles into Chinese and published them in various places that eventually came out with a, a volume in, entitled Zhuo Tian Zhu Jiao Yi Wen Ji. Tra tra uh, translated essays on uh, the history of it, our Catholicism in China. And um, I think there were five or six of my uh, articles in, in that volume. So um, as a, re a result of that, I became known to Chinese scholars. And uh, I was at a um, workshop uh, co-sponsored by the Ricci Institute at the University of San Francisco and the University of Minnesota uh, in Minneapolis a couple of years ago. And uh, it brought together some senior people in the field with young scholars and um, from East Asia. And I was uh, a mentor to a young man from uh, 
uh, Fu Jian, who is working on uh, uh, topic in uh, Protestantism in 20th century China. But um, when uh, we were talking, he suddenly realized that I was not only Robert Enzman, I was also Yen Hua Yang. And um, he had known my work from uh, uh, Professor Gu's work. Mm -hmm. Uh, there are a couple of other uh, scholars who work uh, specifically on uh, Catholicism in 18th century Sichuan. Uh, Wei Yu at uh, the Guangdong Institute of uh, Ethnicity and Religion, uh, who's uh, written a book on uh, Catholicism in Sichuan in the 18th century. <clears throat> and she and I have never met, but we've carried on uh, a lively correspondence. And there's another scholar, um, Guo Lina. I can't remember her institutional affiliation, but she's also working in this area. And uh, I haven't met her and um, haven't had a chance to communicate with her, but I'm very aware of her work. So um, one thing I really hope we can do more in the future is work with our Chinese colleagues. Um. <clears throat> You're in agreement with almost everyone who's been asked that question. <laughs> who's, well, of course, who's, who's not Chinese. We've interviewed some Chinese already. You know, I, when I think of you mentioned going to, I, I presume you went to Edinburgh uh, with the cell to, to, to commemorate James Legg. Um, one thing that, is, is mind, that I'm mindful of is that people like Walter Medhurst, people like James Legg, mm -hmm. they had a Chinese scholar just beside their elbow. And, yes. Yeah, so they were already collaborating. Uh, in a way, um, and, but you want the, the scholars they worked with to get a bit more credit. Um, yes, definitely. Right. Well, I, let me ask you one last question because I'm looking at our time and we have about five more minutes. Um, and I, would, I just really wonder if you have a sense of, is there something up your sleeve next? Because all of us who are in this field, we, we, I think we reserve just a bit of bookshelf space for anything by Robert Entenman. But do you have any projects that are sort of underway that you're sort of finishing or? Well, I, I, one of the things I wanted to do was uh, <clears throat> my, um, the things I've written have, are really scattered. They're, I think I've contributed to about 14 edited volumes. And um, I would really like to bring things together um, in one monograph. I, a couple of years ago, I talked with, uh, an editor at the University of Washington Press. Uh, I'm sure you know her. Um, Lori Hogman. She's Lori Hogman. Yeah, she's yeah. marvelous. Yeah, she's, uh, of course, I worked with you a couple of times. Mm -hmm. But um, yeah, I do find though with uh, my Parkinson's, it uh, slows me down. So I'm not sure if I will actually achieve that. I may continue to write shorter things, mm -hmm. but. Uh, We'll see how that goes. Well, you know, um, there are many, there are scholars who might follow in your footsteps and who may uh, create a, a Robert Entenmann compendium someday. So it may happen by either you or someone else. Yeah, uh, actually I had thought of putting together uh, kind of collected articles, but mm -hmm. um, I think publishers really prefer a, 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 a monograph. A monograph. Right, right. Uh, Professor Entenmann, we just have about one more minute. So let me just uh, take this opportunity first to thank you. Thank you for participating in this interview series. Um, no, my pleasure. And then let me thank you personally for your contribution to this field. I, I know that just uh, not in this office, but in my home office, uh, your work is, is just near me. And, mm -hmm. uh, and it's been something, it's your, your voice has been a voice that has influenced me in my own writing. So just on a personal level, thank you for all the work that you've done and that you're still doing. And uh, I know that people working on this, uh, this uh, interview project, this series, are wishing you uh, the very best of summer and, the very, and very good health. Well, thank you. And uh, thank you for this opportunity. It's been great to talk with you. Great. Thank you so much. Uh -huh.